Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Game Music Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Butno, and today with me is Rich Freeland, a.k.a. Disasterpiece. How you doing, Rich? I'm good. How are you, Jake? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Thanks for asking. Excellent. Um, for people who don't know you somehow, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your career? Because you've worked on a lot of stuff. <laughs> sure. So my name is Rich Vreeland. Um, I make music and sound under the name Disasterpiece, and I've been doing so since about 2004. And mm-hmm. primarily that has consisted of working on games. Um, I've also uh, worked on some films and uh, some TV cartoons and other things that are <laughs> that might need music or sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, got got started with music in high school. Actually, yeah, around high school. Grew up in a musical household. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of stumbled into doing freelance work um, for, for for video games. Your your first game was like in two thousand seven, right? First game was two thousand six. Oh, okay, um, and I've told the story a couple times now. It's 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 kind of weird. Uh, so, I when I was a teenager, I was really into this thing called e wrestling, which is like uh, okay. it's like a it's like creative competitive wrestling fan fiction. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so like so in like the mid. 2000s mm-hmm. this was like a this had like a moment where it was pretty popular with with uh with kids i guess uh okay. and so the way it would work is that there'd be like a website uh typically with a message board sometimes it's mm-hmm. just a message board and um you'd have like a fictional wrestling federation or whatever and people would join this federation and like make their own characters or fulfill the role of a real you know not real but uh, a pre-existing wrestler, <laughs> and uh, you would be assigned matches. Uh, so there'd be an event at the end of the the week. Okay. Um, and you would be assigned, you know, like, oh, you're going to fight this person, or you're going to be in, you know, a tag team match or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so you'd know who your opponents were, and then you'd have the week to write uh, uh, fiction, basically, uh, about your character and about your opponents, and post it to this message board. Huh. And so, um, <laughs> and then at the end of the week, you know, you'd you'd be you'd either be judged or the the federation would decide like how to how, how they want your um, your story arc to go. It, it kind of depends on the federation. Each one was different, but yeah. essentially, this was like a community. Uh, this was a hobby that I had for maybe like four or five years when I was when I was a teenager, and um, that's kind of how I got involved doing freelance work. Yeah. Um, when I was, I probably started doing this when I was like 12 and, um, my mom is a graphic designer. And so I was always around, uh, you know, design and computers. And, um, so I got, I got into doing design, um, when I was fairly young. And so doing these, uh, e-wrestling things, you know, I, for me, it was an opportunity to do like, um, you know, kind of uh, express myself. So, you know, you would yeah. like submit these, you would submit these role plays mm-hmm. and uh, they were usually an HTML file and they had like graphics in them and music and stuff like that. And so I kind of developed a reputation as um, someone who could do graphics and websites for people. Yeah. So when I was like 12 or 13, I started doing freelance work um, with people in like other countries and stuff. Wow. And I was getting checks in the mail from like Malta and like random places. <laughs> My mom was like, what, what are you doing up there in your, in your bedroom? <laughs> um, but that basically, um, in a number of ways, that sort of led me into doing music. I mean, it, it's got me going with doing creative freelance work. Um, but yeah. also I started getting into music and, um, because I was hanging around these sorts of communities, you know, I would post my music there. Mm-hmm. And um, one day there was a wanted post for look, someone looking for music for, um, they, they had a software company and they were making cell phone games. And this was like pre, this was like, you know, the last couple of years before smartphones. Yeah. And so they were looking for someone to do um, MIDI uh, sounds and music. Mm-hmm. So basically you have, a, you have a sound bank, which is like, you know, it's like a hundred 
Uh, I don't I don't know how much I have to explain on this particular. Yeah, thing, I, we've we've <laughs> talked about MIDI before on the on the. Yeah, show. yeah, <laughs> basically like you know you, using uh, uh, canned sounds yeah. to make music and make sound effects, and so that was kind of how I got my start making like chainsaw sounds for it was like a zombie like pre-smartphone mobile game wow. out of like distorted guitar instruments and like <laughs> uh you know canned uh you know canned helicopter sounds and etc um, that's right. yeah cuz midi did have like a helicopter patch if i remember correctly <laughs> yeah it was yeah there were a couple of sound effects that were like canned <laughs> at the end that's of the so sound funny. <laughs> are there any are there any records of this like are there any videos of these games or cuz for the e wrestling you didn't do like theme songs for the wrestlers did you cuz that would have been fantastic i did but i didn't actually write any of them oh, okay. what i would what i would do is i would take popular songs and i would i would usually take like an intro or like an instrumental section and I would loop it. Okay. And so the the first my first real sort of like foray into music production was taking pre-existing songs and like making seamless loops of my favorite parts of the songs mm. cuz that was like a lot of entrance music for wrestlers is uh is like, you know, instrumental and tends to loop and kind of go on and on, so. Yeah. And so you went on and you continued freelancing and then, um, you know, all the big games like Fez and Mini Metro and Hyper Light Drifter. And I guess history sort of writes itself after that. Um, but you have worked on, yeah, like you mentioned, you've worked on a lot of non-game stuff as well, which is pretty cool. Like um, It Follows is probably the, the big one that people would know yeah. uh, most likely. But you've done like an Adventure Time episode, um, you've been doing other animation. Like I actually, I watched the, the DIY series and that's like totally like dense with music. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. Cause, <laughs> Cause they're only like two minutes long and they're so fast paced. Like yeah. how, how long does it take to compose like one of those two minute chunks? Um, well that whole project I, I think took, took about three weeks mm-hmm. and, um, uh, there's a lot of back and forth on those. The reason that they're mm-hmm. so compact is uh, I think in part because they wanted to get a lot of ideas in because it's a, it's kind of like a pilot. I think um, you know if the show was picked up, you know, maybe they would do like a longer format or something and it would be a little yeah. it wouldn't be so crazy, but um yeah. Uh yeah, we uh, over the course of like 3 weeks we put that together and it's funny because those folks who made DIY uh, mm-hmm. Encyclopedia Pictura, they're actually my my landlords like I rented um like a little brick hut in the parking lot of their animation studio. <laughs> okay. And I was working in there for like a year. Uh, huh. And they're a great, you know, great group of, of people. So and, you collaborated uh, with your landlord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very unusual. But I, I mean, I, you know, I uh, was a great admirer of, of what they do. So it was, it was a real um, joy to get to collaborate with them. Yeah, yeah, it turned out fantastic. And another another um, thing that you worked on uh, that I just learned of while researching uh, for this podcast was Beasts of Balance, which is like a board game slash app hybrid. Um, where I mean, I'm sure you can explain it better. B- barely. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to explain, but uh, yeah, essentially, uh, it 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 comes with a physical component, which is like a base station, which is essentially a platform Mm -hmm. that um, you, and then all these pieces that you're meant to stack um, to build a tower. Yeah. And the, the base station um, has some kind of like RFID scanning component or something like that, where you, you, you scan the piece to the base Mm -hmm. station and it knows which piece it is. Yeah. And so it uses that information with an, with a, with like an iPad app to track the gameplay and to see like, Mm -hmm. Who's placed which pieces? Uh, you know what the game state is at any given moment, and so the iPad app is—it's um, this sort of like uh, you're sort of building uh, an ecosystem. There are these, mm-hmm. there are different biomes. There's um, there's land. There's the sea. There's the, there's the sky, and you're you're basically adding uh, creatures into this world. And so the the pieces that you play with are like. There are like six base creatures, mm-hmm. and then there are modifier pieces that allow you to crossbreed and evolve the creatures into new creatures. Mm-hmm. And altogether, there's like a there's a insane number of um, different 
creature possibilities. Yeah, I was watching some gameplay, and and the people I was watching got to the sp- spectacular tentacular or something like that, and I was like, all right, that's <laughs> that's a beast. Wow. I don't even remember <laughs> what that like, was, or if that that might have been in a in like an update or something. <laughs> I don't know. It, it at least had one octopus in it. I know that much. Awesome. But <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting project, and we we. I set out to try to build a, um, like a like a modular music system that would mm-hmm. uh, where the, the the sound of the music would change depending on the state of the world, mm-hmm. depending on which creatures you had in the world, and um, uh, the possibility space ended up being so enormous that we had to kind of like we had to walk a fine line between um, variability and predictability um Mm -hmm. because at one point we you know trying to create unique sort of representations musically of like literally thousands of different um varieties of creatures was just uh, it wasn't really practical (laughs) yeah because i'm imagining i imagine that you were thinking like maybe sort of a base like musical module for each animal and then as those change and evolve and migrate and all that stuff like Mm -hmm. there would be different combinations of those based on that was that the idea that's essentially how the system works um i have to go i should probably write a blog post about this and to go into the details because i I don't remember them Mm -hmm. super well off the top of my head but essentially each each base creature had like had like an instrument and a four phrase, uh, and um, then each sort of like second generation, uh, like like crossbreed or evolution would also have mm-hmm. like a mod- like a modified version of that. Gotcha. But what was this? What's like crazy about the the game is that um, there's always a primary and a secondary creature in every crossbreed. Okay. <laughs> so. If it's if the primary is the warthog and the bear is the secondary, then you would get one kind of you get like a war bear. Okay. But if 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 it was the opposite, then you'd get like you know a bear oh. hog or whatever. And yeah. they were they were different creatures. So. <laughs> so how do you represent that musically when it's the same two elements just being rearranged in a different way, right? Yeah. Well, that was part of the challenge that we tried to address, but I, I think. Um, it's been it's been a hot minute, but I believe that we chose to um, ignore some of those different uh, differences. If they, yeah, um, I think because a, a lot of what we were doing was just trying to give the world vibrancy and to you know just make it feel like every game would would sound and feel a little bit different. Yeah. But there was a level of detail there in, in the actual um, results of the of the creatures that. Uh, we thought we could probably get away with glossing mm-hmm. over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you definitely should write a blog post on that whenever you have time because it's difficult to sort of, because I know you have, you have the, the soundtrack on, on Bandcamp, but it's really like remixes, right? Like it's a remix kit, kind of like what you did with Mini Metro, which makes sense given what you're telling me this. Uh, telling me here, right? But like when I was trying to find like gameplay and everything, it was always with the people talking over the board game, so I couldn't really yeah. hear the music. There so. aren't a lot of long plays with no commentary of board games. It's pretty unusual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really. It's not really a category that exists. No, that's, because you know people talk when they play play board games. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. But that's really funny. But. But yeah, okay. So so the remix kit does does make sense because that was always something that um like I've played I played quite a lot of Mini Metro and when I saw the uh, the Bandcamp page, um, which is basically like you you have a couple of short tracks, but you just give um, the purchaser just basically all the samples yeah. to do their own thing because Mini Metro is so procedural right. that there's no other way that you could really make a soundtrack unless you literally just like recorded gameplay of each level. Yeah, I mean there's literally no track, there's really literally no like pieces of music uh that exist in the files of the game. Uh it's all just like individual samples and mm-hmm. we really wanted to do like a proper soundtrack but uh it was going to require um it was either going to require a level of artistic license that I wasn't sure I wanted to take with like mm. picking and choosing recordings, um, or yeah. we were going to have to build some kind of like interactive soundtrack, essentially. Mm. And then when we started thinking about that more, um, it just it didn't seem 
it didn't seem like a very clear cut thing to do um, because the game, the the way that the game handles sound effects and music, it's all so intertwined. Yeah, that it's hard to it can be hard to like imagine what an interactive soundtrack would look like. Like, are you simu- are you simulating like gameplay in order to have the create the soundtrack? Like, it's it's very peculiar. <laughs> it's a very peculiar problem. Um, well, that's the thing because, like, to me, like the interactive soundtrack in a lot of ways is just the game. You know, just put it on endless mode, right. and then you can just enjoy the sounds, right? So, right. It's so it's so intertwined with the game. I mean, it's that that was always the intention was to create this very one to one relationship, and so to like to detach it from the game is was kind of a tall order. Um, that being said, I, I still would like to. I'm still going to try. I think at some point to create some kind of. EP or something that is made up of recordings uh, of gameplay. Yeah. So what we'll see that that'll be, you know, that won't that won't really be like a quintessential soundtrack. You know what I mean? Like it won't be like yeah. official an official sound version or whatever. It mm-hmm. it'll kind of be its own thing. Like it'll be a separate kind of piece. Of, uh, yeah. So yeah. just because of the nature of it. Yeah. Was was Mini Metro really like the first? Uh, game that you worked on where you really dug your claws into like the programming side of it? Yeah. Uh, the first, well, the first commercial game where I got hired to, to do that. Okay. For gotcha. sure. Yeah. Actually, and actually the um, part of how I ended up working on that game was uh, because of a project, a procedural music project that I built called January. Oh, okay. Um, which which was my first. Uh, it was my excuse to learn how to program. Essentially, mm. uh, it's a. It's a little. It, it it's kind of like a game, but it's primarily just about making music. And mm. you control a little person, uh, walking around, like in a side scroller sort of format, mm-hmm. on a um, in a field of snow, and it's snowing, and all the different snowflakes have different shapes, which correlate to different behaviors. And so you stick your tongue out while you walk around and you lick different snowflakes. And huh. uh, it's the whole thing generates sort of like a procedural um, music soundscape. Oh, that sounds really cool. Is that like available to like download anywhere? Or um, It's a little bit behind the times. Uh, oh, okay. I, I made it uh, in ActionScript 3. Uh, which I is don't kind know of what an, that is. It's it's basically like Flash. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but I did I did port it with with the help of um uh, of a gentleman uh, uh, named uh, Timothy Healy uh, probably a few years ago. Um, okay. The, the PC build still works. The Mac build currently does not work. Um, the game is open source and. Uh, oh, okay. It's called January. You can you can find information about it on my website. So. Cool, cool. So, so, and what year did January um, come out? The original version um, I made in two thousand nine. Oh wow! Okay. And then I made, I made another version in two thousand twelve or two thousand thirteen. Okay. And then, and then a few years ago, I when I when we ported it to um, desktop, um, we I added some additional features to it. Cool. Cool. So it was sort of an ongoing personal project to just sort of keep your or develop and keep your programming chops up for when a project like Mini Metro comes along, I suppose. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I think over time, um, my ability to program uh, has, um, or I've just found more excuses to do it. Yeah. Um, or just found more ways that I can use that skill to help me with uh, different sorts of tasks, mm-hmm. um, whether it's like implementation and audio for, ga- uh, audio for games or whether it's like workflow optimization. Um, mm. I, those are primarily the places where I've done most of my coding. Cool. But, but do you think maybe have, like, having that procedural um, practice under your belt helped when you were developing like Fez's soundtrack and all these things that did have dynamic elements to it? Or do you think the conceptual things uh, were enough to get you through those projects? Well, so like on, on Fez, you know, I didn't really do any coding. Um, yeah. But I think it just helps to 
it was it probably just helped me that I was thinking about how to create music in a nonlinear way. Um, mm. But I mean, I think at that point in time, you know, I was in college um, and I was, you know, just getting into um, writing music for games and thinking a lot about it and particularly was really excited about, you know, the, the ways in which music for games is different than music in, in other, other, yeah. other mediums, you know, the yeah. interact, interactivity of it, the nonlinearity that you can, that you can achieve, um, you know, uh, creating algorithmic music, things like that. So. Yeah, no, it opens a whole new world of possibilities. Um, do you think that like knowing programming is a well, definitely helpful in some ways, but like a tool that composers who are looking, especially for like indie, who are looking to get into it and develop their career, do you think that's something that they should learn? Absolutely. Um, okay. It's not. It's not necessary, but it's it's such a powerful tool to have at your disposal, mm-hmm. and it also. Um, it allows you to, you know, it allows you to do your own implementation, um, yeah. or you know, to do to do a large amount of it to take to take a decent amount of uh, of the workload off of, you know, a programmer or whoever you might be working with. Yeah. So I think um, uh, it's and and um, immersing yourself in uh, coding, I think, helps to it helps you. Uh, conceptualize and understand the way in which software works and games work. Yeah. So I, I think it's uh, kind of a no brainer to, to try. I mean, it, to just try, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to take it, take it slow and, um, you know, go through some tutorials or, you know, read, read some entry level kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think now more than ever, it's easy to get into it. Um, still difficult, but at least like simple to get into it because of how many tutorials and stuff there are yeah, available, yeah. right? Yeah, the yeah. resources are so abundant at this point. I mean, yeah. but and so you, but you mentioned how like programming you can get into procedural and all this stuff. Um, it really does change the compositional process. I suppose mm-hmm. when you're looking at something like Mini Metro or Beast of Balance, um, you can't really approach it compositionally the same as other more like traditional forms of music, right? Yeah, it's a it's a totally different way of thinking about how how the music exists, how it's how it's built, what its relationship is to to the game. Yeah, um, it's a much more moment to moment relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, the the benefit of um, writing music in the traditional way is that you have more, you might have more control over the feeling of the music. Um, you know more control over creating sort of a nuanced uh, progression over time. Mm-hmm. But it's, it tends to be less married to the moment to moment of a game. You know, in a lot of, a lot of cases that's, that's totally fine and, and, and works, works great. Um, yeah. You know, there are a lot of examples of games that just have um, longer, you know, like uh, linear pieces of music that, um, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're doing some other kind of, uh, variation there. You're doing like crossfading, different like different intensity levels, or just just you know different variations on a theme, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And you're not as concerned with the specific moment to moment of that. I mean, if you have like a if you have you know if you have a game where you're exploring and you're kind of doing your own thing, I mean, there might be just so many things that you could be doing from moment to moment that uh, it 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 sort of limits the it can limit the structure um, of of the music. Um, you know, it's kind of a trade-off, I think, similar to like, you know, a game like No Man's Sky or something where, you know, you have a very wide, uh, bucket, but it's only like, you know, an inch, an inch deep, you know, you have all these like systems that are really, they're neat, but they're not enough to like fill this like massive, um, this massive void. And that's where like the hand, the handcrafted stuff kind of comes in. Mm -hmm. And I think with, with procedural music, it can be similar. Um, so it's, it's really sort of like a, a, uh, a lot of it for me has always felt like trying to find the balance where you're not going too procedural, you're not going too far that the the music starts to feel robotic and like detached from humanity. Okay. And so, um, you know, it's going to work better in certain applications. Um, you know, like a game like Mini Metro, I think is a great it's a great candidate for a procedural music system mm-hmm. because it's all about it's it's sort of about like the the machinations of like a metro system and it's yeah you know it's very like it's very like uh it's very rhythmic um 
just from a gameplay. Like the gameplay is rhythmic, so it's yeah. just a very natural sort of like you're not. Tr- I'm not trying to like create sweeping, you know, sweeping underscore and like themes and all this kind of stuff for like a game about trains. I mean, you know, it's not really about people; it's about systems. So yeah, a game about a game about systems with a score that's all systems. You know, it's a systems oriented score, so it's yeah. not about. You know, it's not about light motifs and stuff like that. So it's a really good. I think it's a really good marriage in that. In yeah. That way. Yeah. So so when you're looking at those more macro um, sort of pieces and and games where you have the long uh, themes and all these sorts of things, what are some of your like, I guess, go to compositional techniques for say like I assume like Hyperlight Drifter and and Fez and those were sort of more in this uh, style of. Um, handcrafted music, right? Right, exactly. Um, so, and the question was, what how are do you some go of your, about it? Yeah, like, what are some of your like go-to compositional techniques and approaches to these? Um, I think for Fez and Hyperlight Drifter, there's for me there was a a process that relied a lot on intuition and like okay. taking either taking footage or images or playing playing levels and getting a feel for what the tone should be or what the tone what would what would serve the the context sometimes that's writing music from scratch and making making judgments you know is this does this feel like the right sort of thing or not mm-hmm. other times it's it would be you know going through pre-existing music that i'd written whether it's like sketches or unfinished pieces or things that i never used um mm-hmm. Going through like a large catalog of those sorts of things, and basically, you know, having having like here's the here's the level or here's the context that I'm trying to write music for. Here are like a thousand different candidates, <laughs> uh, you know, seeds of ideas or you know things that are at different various stages of completion. You know, do do any of these feel good? Do any of these match up? And yeah. um, if something does, I mean, you know, even you know that will be. That will be on a scale, you know. That could it could feel really good. It could feel like the beginning of something good, mm. um, and uh, that was a way on both of those projects that I supplemented my own ability to just write like new music on the fly for yeah. for, for levels and stuff. Like because that's it's challenging to do like high quality work from scratch all the time. So. Mm. I built up a, I built up a practice of um, just cataloging and keeping all of my ideas. Yeah, for sure. Well, because I mean, those soundtracks are like pretty vast. Like, I think Hyperlight's like at least two hours of music or something like that. And, and yeah, you were working on Hyperlight for what, like two, two, three years? Or yeah, three years like, on and off. Yeah, and so even then, like that's a lot of original music as well as all your other projects. And I'm sure you're working on at the time. Yep. Um, what what other because y- you've stated in the past that you are always sort of looking to do new stuff. What other like w- weird or interesting compositional approaches have you taken to your soundtracks? Because um, I hmm. saw one here that um, Gun Gunhouse, which was like almost yeah. entirely loop based. Yeah, yeah, Gun Gunhouse. I I had a conversation with a with a colleague of mine, um, and he he had brought up the bastion soundtrack okay and he was talking he had he had gone to see a talk by darren korb mm-hmm. uh the composer yeah he was actually just my last uh the last podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah small world <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, apparently he had used a lot of uh a lot of like canned loops uh in the soundtrack oh and okay. um i think uh i think i think i had a negative predisposition to that technique uh Hmm. and i wanted to challenge challenge my preconceived notions about that yeah um and so i set out to um try to create and it was a project that there was a lot of flexibility like it was kind of it just needed to be fun and groovy yeah so to me loop a loop based soundtrack would be perfect for that yeah um and so I set out to uh, just, you know, really rely heavily on like you know the the canned loops that come with, 
you know, GarageBand and Logic um, uh, to to inspire me to like to come up with tracks. And um, I mean, my my perception of loops totally changed dramatically. It dramatically changed mm-hmm. my perception of using loops because it got me to a lot of really strange and fun places that I, you know, I probably would not have got to otherwise. Um, like, I mean, there are, there are examples like uh, where I would take, I would come up with these like weird ways of like re um, recontextualizing loops. Like okay. I would take like, I would take a loop of like a, like a Chinese stringed instrument and okay. I would, I would change, you know, I would use like, like flex pitch or something to change all of the notes in that loop. And then I would like trans and then I would transcribe, transcribe the loop to other instruments to like synthesizers okay. or something. Yeah. And so, and change the, change the rhythm. And suddenly I was like doing, you know, taking something that was meant for, you know, meant for one application potentially and doing something totally unrelated with it. Um, yeah. So really just fun. really creating a compositional like approach out of the loops instead of just, Finding good combinations of them in, in a lot of cases, right? Exactly, and just yeah. it's it was really just cool because it, uh, when you have that when you have access to all these initial seeds of ideas, the mm-hmm. creative process it's very um, it flows very naturally uh, yeah. and quick and quickly, and it becomes more about it becomes more about um, uh, feedback loops, listening and like iteration mm-hmm. and making making you know. Like you, you kind of, in some ways, you almost skip the the typical initial stage of creating, and you just go straight to making all the the value judgments about you know what you're doing and how you're refining what you know what what you started with. Yeah, and that sounds fun because that first step uh, is at least for me, it's often the most uh, frustrating to get an idea on the paper to sort of start with. So yeah. I don't know if I don't know if you find you find it the same, but totally. No, I totally yeah. do, and I I often have to force myself past the initial stage um, just to get just to get to where the piece is going on its because it, it, I feel like a lot of times the piece is going somewhere on its own if, if, if I'm just willing to follow that trail mm-hmm. and it may not le- it may not lead to where I want it to go but um, it's gonna lead somewhere uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and oftentimes it will lead somewhere interesting it might not be appropriate if I'm trying to do something specific. But, you know, even if it's not appropriate, it may be appropriate in some other application later. So gotcha. Yeah, because that can be that must be kind of like tricky for freelance. Um if you're you've got a deadline and you're finding that your idea is going down the wrong direction. Like yeah, you can use it later, but you've yeah. still got to hit your deadline, right? Yeah. I mean I last year I worked on a feature film and I wrote about 85 minutes of orchestral music. And oh, uh, wow. I got to a stage where I had, I had to write a couple of, you know, I had to be writing a couple of minutes of music every day to meet, yeah. to meet the deadline. And so I was in a position where I couldn't, if I wanted to finish the project, I couldn't really uh, dilly dally or um, take heed to my inner sort of uh critic inner critic or like you know i couldn't be too like emotional about it mm. uh which i might i might be in a in a more relaxed state yeah. i didn't really have any choice i just had to power through every day and just it didn't matter like i just needed to write at all costs and just hope that it turned out okay and um for me that is not the most pleasant thing to do, of but, course. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, gener- <laughs> I generally end up with something that I like if if yeah. I just put the time in and the and the effort. So, yeah, um, you know, because I'll just keep I'll just keep you know I'll just keep changing it until I like it. So I mean, it might take a while, but it'll get there. <laughs> um, so do you do you have any like other like compositional approaches that you want to try in the future? Or is it very much like a, you see a project and you kind of get an idea of what you want to do for this one? Um, it's a good question. I, yeah, sometimes I'll come up with something that's, uh, unrelated or inappropriate for a project and mm-hmm. I'll, you know, I'll stow it away to, to try it later. Um, on hyperlight drifter, 
there was a technique that um, uh, my friend and colleague Matteo Lugo uh, showed me, which was uh, had to do with um, flashcards that had the twelve keys on them. Oh yeah, yeah. I and then this. using those to create little games for yourself to ge- to generate chord progressions or melodies, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had devised. Uh, there was uh, in Hyperlight Drifter. There's this sort of arena mode mm-hmm. where you fight waves of enemies, and um, I had this idea where I was going to create um, these. Uh, they were like four note tone rows. Uh, yeah, but it would move through. It would move through all twelve keys. You spoke about this in your GDC talk, uh, right? Um, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think I might have showed like I might have, yeah I might have touched on it briefly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll we'll continue. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was the idea was to have, you know, to to lay out um, to lay out all twelve keys, in a way that you would just you would just shift four notes at a time through all twelve uh, all twelve notes, and so you'd mm-hmm. you'd basically be hitting twelve chords, uh, twelve different modalities. Yeah. Um, that were like based on four notes, yeah. and so you'd be like, you'd be like, kind of dovetailing from from like one one mode to another mode to another mode. Yeah, because only one note would actually change each chord, but the bass was changing every chord, right? If I remember yes, correctly, yes, I believe that is, okay. is how it worked. Yeah, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, did you end up using that for the game? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. We we ended up doing. I think I think it's just ambience in the arena. Um, oh, okay. I don't know why. I might. It might have been laziness, or <laughs> I think. I think what happened was I wrote a piece for it that I that I liked, uh, but the 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 devs they put the piece in a demo that they brought with them to PAX or whatever, and so it was playing mm-hmm. on loop on the show floor. Oh my god! For days, and so by the end of it, like Alex, the creative director, was totally done with the track, and he never wanted to hear it again. <laughs> That's so funny because it was like sabotage the music. <laughs> it, was, it was like fifty seconds long, but I I I released it actually uh, as a as a track called uh, a horde of one. Oh, cool! Yeah, like a couple months ago. Okay, cool, cool. So that so that technique you actually haven't used in a game yet then. No, I haven't used that. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well there you go. <laughs> You've got one for for next time. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, we were coming up on time. So, I wanted I wanted to ask you your favorite game music before we wrap up and you mentioned Chrono Cross, yeah. uh, which I'm not surprised about because uh, everyone always brings like a SNES JRPG onto the show for their favorite game music, but we haven't heard Chrono Cross yet. So tell me, what what is it about Chrono Cross for you? Tell me the story. So Chrono Cross is um, af- after Super Mario RPG, which I think is the first RPG I ever played and actually enjoyed. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> actually enjoy what was before that that you didn't uh i don't even remember okay <laughs> i don't think i owned any rpgs before that i think i borrowed super mario rpg from a friend or rented it or something uh yeah yeah but after that you know i i suddenly had a uh, bit of an appetite for rpgs and i don't even know how i got this game i think it was like a a totally random gift like a like a gift purchase from like my mom or something okay. um and uh yeah, it was like the second RPG I ever really got into, and um, I just have a lot of fond memories of of the game and um, yeah. and the music. Um, and you know, later, like going back, like I went back and played Chrono Trigger, which I which I like as well. Um, but mm-hmm. but uh, there was something about the music in Chrono Cross, particularly that uh, that always stood out to me more. And it's I I haven't played the game myself. I didn't really get into RPGs until like. PS2 era, I guess. Um, huh. But like the music is like pretty, pretty incredible from what I've heard. Like um, the opening song, Scars of Time, is like kind of a banger. Yeah, and totally. Then, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then uh, the other one that everyone was like, you know, gushing over was Radical Dreamers, which I assume is like the sad part of the game. Yeah. That's like the vocal, the vocal song. Totally. Uh, <laughs> with uh, the like the choir at the end, yeah. But so it really, it really does sound like for you. Then it is like it's the game that just has such an impact on you, and the music is very good. But yeah. as a result of the impact the game had on you, 
the music also has that impact. I think that's definitely a part of it. I also think that the style of the music was something that I was not, maybe I was not super familiar with. Um, you know, Mitsuda uh, kind of, ha- I think, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of game soundtracks, especially from that time period, I think he had a pr- pretty unique sound that was very mm-hmm. much, it was a lot of modal music, and he did, he did a lot of really interesting things with chord progressions, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, inspired by, you know, music from different parts of the world, um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's just something about his style, the, the, like, the eclectic nature of what he did, and his melody writing, and his chord progressions, and, um, mm-hmm. and his use of, yeah, all that kind of stuff that that uh, yeah. I guess stood, stood out to me. Now, would you say that like the the soundtrack influences your music, or is it more of like an emotional like influence? Um, I would say that I think I'm probably uh, a bit removed from it now. Like it's mm. I, like it's it would probably be harder to draw like a direct line from me to that soundtrack now because. Mm-hmm. I've listened to so much music and been have done lots of different things since I first played yeah. Chrono Cross, which was like you know when it came <laughs> out, which was like almost yeah. twenty years ago. Um, yeah. But certainly early on, um, I think early on you could probably pick out the uh, the stylistic influence. Um, as well as the emotional influence. Cool, yeah. Because um, your earliest, your earliest album that you at least have uploaded is "History of the Reland." I haven't heard it, but does that have anything that pe- we might be able to hear the Chrono Cross influence on? Um, possibly that is that that was retroactively released. Um, I was sitting on my oldest tracks. It's mostly like new metal, like really poorly recorded drop D guitar. Oh, nice. Kind of, kind of stuff. <laughs> and so for a while, I didn't release it because I was like, yeah, this is kind of, it's not that great. <laughs> but yeah, um, but it's fun to have that stuff up there. For you sure. Know? I think, I think probably where you would hear more of the influence would be like on the Chronicles of Jamage, the Jam Age, and uh, Eight Byte and the Warring Nations. Okay. Which were two, there were two of the early, those are probably, those are like my two first two proper full length records. Um, okay. And so those are, they're kind of a weird soup of um, like prog metal and prog rock influences and video game soundtrack influences and just sort of like uh, new metal and like like '90s rock riff kind of stuff and okay and just like a a very raw like youthful sort of giddiness for oh my god I. I can write music in the computer that I don't have to play. Like it can be as crazy as I want it to be. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a lot of very athletic and wacky, like sec, you know, like mm-hmm. passages and stuff. Um, yeah. And it's all kind of uh, what I would do is sort of as I was going, I would sort of conceptualize what I was doing as some sort of narrative. Like you know, there's they're they're supposed to be yeah. concept albums. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, how much of that was like predetermined. It's hard to say. I think some of it was, I just kind of intellectualized it after it was done. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I was just having fun with it. And, and uh, especially 8-Byte, you know, I was at that time, I had just like, I had just read The Lord of the Rings for the first time. You know, I was like, a, mm. I don't know, however old I was, eight, 19 or something, 18. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that was probably... That's probably the most epic I've ever gone. <laughs> That's uh, fun. On that album. So. That's super. In an age that is not our own, yeah. a young boy lives a life of peace amongst his brethren. I'm going to take a listen to that. That <laughs> sounds so much fun. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Rich. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, likewise. My pleasure, man. Yeah. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me uh, at disasterpeace.com, uh, where I have a very extensive blog. Uh, about my work Mm -hmm. and i'm also on twitter um at disasterpiece and you also have a youtube channel too that you occasionally post videos to talking about your work as well indeed i think people should definitely check out. indeed and facebook and all that all that good stuff all the things i think they'll find you yes cool all right well (laughs) thanks so much rich yeah my pleasure